Welcome to all of you who have uh, joined us today. We are super excited. Uh, we have a, an excellent panel for you. And, and I think I just wanted a, a small reflection on thinking on the upside of the very difficult time that I think we're all going through, that it has allowed all of us to, to connect. Uh, and I think to reach so many more people that are, are joining us here. And I think that's gonna be a really good thing um, to really start to develop uh, groundwater resilience and this big global community across the world. So uh, with this, I just want to say that we have a, a fantastic uh, panel. Um, we had a lot of abstracts and, and I can tell you that it was difficult to choose, but I think you'll hear examples from all across the world of really good experiences on groundwater governance, uh, which we think of course is gonna be uh, at the core of any solutions that, uh, that we need to address. Uh, I also want to welcome uh, our you know, um, keynote speaker. Um, we are very privileged to have um, Aditi Mukherjee. Uh, she's a principal researcher at IMI. Uh, she's uh, currently leading um, the work on climate change adaptation and resilience. And she also worked in the IC mode. She's an expert on the whole region of South Asia. And I think she is particularly uh, well suited at the, you know, to accompany us on this uh, conference and particularly our topic. So she's also the, the uh, lead uh, chapter author for uh, the chapter on water for the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change for the Working Group too. Um, just a few uh, housekeeping rules before I give the floor to Aditi. Um, to say that um, in, for the purpose of the conference, only the question and answer is enabled for the for the audience. Um, please send us your, your questions. It's, it's really important because for us, it's more like a dialogue rather than kind of like a one way. So whatever you ask, uh, you know, Yura is committed that we will then approach the, the panelists so that then they can answer your questions offline and then this will be posted on the on the Yura website. So please feel that your questions will be answered. We are very interested in your participation. Uh, as you know, through online, it's a bit more difficult, but that's why we want to create any possible space that you feel that your questions are being addressed. Um, and with that, I think uh, I give the floor to Aditi for her keynote speak. Aditi, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Elena, and thank you uh, all of you for inviting me. It's a great honor and a pleasure to be speaking to all of you. Um, uh, Elena asked me to talk about groundwater and resilience to climate change. I will do that and uh, uh, in, in the 15 minutes that's allocated, but I will also base a lot of it uh, on my experience from South Asia and India in particular. Next slide, please. Uh, the, the, the key message that I want to leave all the audience with is that groundwater, if managed well, will be critical for climate resilient agriculture. But I focus on agriculture, but then I want to say not only agriculture, but it will be also critical for climate resilient cities for that matter. But this presentation will focus mostly on agriculture. And how do we manage groundwater? Well, I want to propose that managing groundwater in the context of agriculture really requires a water energy food nexus approach. So I'll, I'll talk about uh, those two issues. Uh, next slide, please. Yes, okay. Uh, sorry, it's a bit crowded slide, uh, uh, but uh, this is um, the work that we are doing with the IPCC and overall uh, reading around groundwater, and this is a community of groundwater specialists. So uh, uh, many of the things I think are already known for, for most of you, but overall, um, even though we are just using about one eighth of the annual recharge of global groundwater globally, so we are only using one eighth. Uh, but the reality is that there are certain hotspots in the world where there is a massive amount of groundwater depletion happening. I think yesterday's inaugural session had those hotspots using gray satellite by Professor Familia Getty and others. So we all kind of know which those hotspots are. And some of the studies are showing that in this hotspot, the reason that we have those groundwater hotspots are less to do with climate and much more to do with human-induced depletion in the form of extensive uh, irrigation, for instance. 
So some of the top hotspots of groundwater depletion, um, according to studies uh, with, with uh, depletion rates exceeding 20 millimeter per year are uh, high plains of, um, of California, Arabian aquifer, uh, then uh, North Africa, we have the Indo-Gangetic Basin of which I'll talk about more and North China Plain. I'm happy to see that there we have speakers from China as well. So I'm looking forward to learning from, from the various regions that are represented today. Uh, so, uh, two interesting things that I thought were quite relevant going forward. One is in the humid regions, there is a linear association between precipitation and recharge, which I think is, is something that we all know. But what was interesting is, and I, I believe this is a more of a recent finding, is that of, and I, I heard in uh, yesterday in Karen Willock's presentation as well, that as aridity increases, we have more of diffuse or focused recharge dominates, leading to some kind of a non-linear relationship between precipitation and recharge. And we are already observing this episodic recharge in India and USA. So, I mean, one of the things that we are pretty certain about is increase in more extreme events. So even if the total quantum of rainfall doesn't change, they are likely to fall in a shorter duration more intensely. So uh, if this, this uh, relationship between episodic recharge in arid and semi-arid regions and that recharge increases with more intense rainfall actually holds, uh, I mean, studies are showing that they hold right now, then it, it, it's likely to make groundwater more resilient to climate change in dryland areas. But as I said in the next slide, next please. Uh, this is, um, yeah, can you go to the next one? Yeah. So, so that's kind of what's been observed and then what's been projected again, some studies, a synthesis studies actually showing that uh, projected changes in groundwater due to climate change will lead to general decrease in recharge in aquifers located in arid, semi-arid. So that is kind of a bit different from this, you know, evidence on episodic uh, recharge that I mentioned just now. Groundwater recharge evidence again shows will increase in northwest of India and North China Plain. Um, in in, in semi-arid India, uh, we heard that the projected increase in future rainfall will increase groundwater recharge. The expected irrigation expansion is likely to negate. So I think the bottom of it, we keep back to this uh, use in terms of irrigation and irrespective of what happens to recharge, I think controlling demand or managing demand for groundwater would still remain critical. So there would be climate change uh, fingerprint for sure, especially in recharge mediated through rainfall periodicity, rainfall, um, you know, intensity, et cetera. But overall, what what's remains is that large uncertainties remain in groundwater models vis-a-vis -vis climate change. But what's not uncertain is this very general kind of, you know, intuitive knowledge that if we pump more than uh, than was the long-term renewable recharge, the water levels will go down, and that's I think coming out quite clearly. So that's kind of very briefly what the literature is saying about groundwater and climate change observed as well as projected. And now I want to move on. And here I kind of say that okay, there are very good possibilities that groundwater would be uh, one source of um, you know uh, uh, climate resilience. But but what do we need to do? So I'll quickly go through a case study from India kind of, uh, yeah, next slide, please. So uh, groundwater plays a critical role in water and food security in India. As most of you know in this meeting that India is the largest user of groundwater. South Asia generally is the largest user of groundwater in the world with around 250 cubic kilometers. That's almost uh, more than one fourth of the total extraction that's happening. In India, it's very important. 60% of India's irrigation is from groundwater, 50% rice and wheat and 70% uh, are grown with groundwater. They are also important for uh, rural India for meeting even domestic needs and almost 50% of urban water share is derived from groundwater. So it's kind of critical I, and it's not new for this audience. We all know that. Next slide, please. So very briefly, a history of what exactly happened in, in India vis-a-vis -vis groundwater is we saw a huge increase in groundwater irrigation in the mid 60s. The green line here is about groundwater irrigation and you can see a major spurt in groundwater irrigations coinciding in, uh, with the green revolution, which also happened in the 1970s, mid 70s. Before that, uh, traditionally India is to be irrigated with canals and tanks and their share has more or less remained constant and that of groundwater has increased. And this is again, very familiar uh, to many of you who work in arid, semi-arid places. Next, please. Um, and next. 
so i'm not going to show a series of slides india does something called the minor irrigation census the ministry of water resources does it every 5 years or so the first was in 1987 and here every dot represents a groundwater well india has currently around 20 million groundwater wells the highest number anywhere in the world if you go quickly and the and uh, the trick here is to keep your eyes sorry can you go back uh, two slides please yes uh, one more slide yeah so the trick here keep your eyes fixed at some point and this kind of you know tells you how the number of wells and tube wells have, have increased so uh, yeah next one this was um, yeah so in 1994 11.5 million then uh, the next one please in 2001 we went up to 18.5 million then the next one please uh, 2007 we had 19.7 million wells and according to the latest survey which is 2013 14 next one please Uh, we have around uh, um, around twenty uh, twenty million wells and tube wells, and if you see that overall, it seems as if the number is kind of plateaued. The bar graph shows the number of wells and tube wells, and it seems to have stabilized. But uh, what's happening is many of the shallow wells are getting replaced with deep wells. So it doesn't really mean that the groundwater extraction might be declining. Next one, please. however there are very uh, clear regional dimensions we have parts of india which are clearly over exploited in terms of groundwater and parts of india which are underdeveloped in eastern india and that's where i am joining you all from from the from the city of kolkata right now it's most of the eastern india has relatively uh, are in a safe uh, groundwater state as in the uh, extraction does not uh, exceed uh, annual recharge if we go uh, to the next slide the okay uh, so so that's that was like i talked about groundwater for a while and then um, i just wanted to uh, bring us back to another aspect that i think needs a lot of attention and possibly we often don't provide give as much attention is that of energy groundwater requires energy uh, for pumping as we all know and uh, actually energy policies have a lot of influence on groundwater pumping especially in a country like india where uh, the food policies are such that uh, that uh, the the overall uh, there is a overall subsidy regime for food to make food uh, cheap and affordable for the large uh, population of a poor country which means that the farmers uh, food prices the price at which they can sell food is kind of regulated therefore um the farmers uh, cannot be expected to pay for the inputs that they need to grow food at market prices either because you know they they won't get the market value for their food so therefore you have this system where both the output prices are subsidized and kind of controlled through various means therefore the government also provides farmers with a lot of input subsidies including electricity so in many states in india electricity is either highly subsidized for farmers or it's given completely free of cost and that actually emanates from india's food policy of keeping food prices affordable for the large uh, population so as a result what we have seen is this in this graph i won't go into the detail but what it shows is the rapid increase in agricultural electricity use this bar graph shows rapid increase in agricultural electricity use right from 1970s all the way uh, i have more recent data somehow i forgot to update this but uh, all the way up till now if we go back oh, sorry if you uh, next slide please <coughs> excuse me so overall there has been 12 fold increase in electricity demand in india overall but 25 fold increase in agricultural electricity demand so agriculture in india has become very energy intensive can we go to the next slide please so but there is again a very deep energy divide it's not all parts of india that gets electricity for groundwater pumping actually the parts of india where you saw those uh, re, those blocks were over exploited maps quite well with all these red blocks which are also where farmers predominantly use electric pumps so there is actually a link between use of electric pumps for groundwater pumping and groundwater over exploitation while all the yellow parts of india that you see the eastern india that is mostly dependent on diesel this has changed a little bit now but is still predominantly this divide still holds to to a large extent though it's it's is not as stark as this map from 90 uh, from almost uh, 20 years ago shows uh, can we go back can we next slide please yeah next one 
Okay, so what I was just trying to say was uh, within the time is that um, managing groundwater is not simply about in many of the developed countries of the world and Elena is here, she has done so much work in Spain, even in a developed country with more resources is never simple. It's never a matter of just having a law and implementing it, right? But but just imagine the implementation capacity that a country like Spain or USA might have and compare that with a country like India, it just with number of wells, I mean, 24.5 million, how do you license all those wells? How do you monitor all those wells? It's, it's just nearly impossible when most countries have struggled with even, you know, 100,000 wells. And I, I know of, of in Mexico or in, or in Spain, it has never been easy. It has been always a very iterative and a very difficult process of making sure that farmers actually um yeah i mean uh, do what is needed to be uh, to comply and even when the when the legislate when the overall legal framework is much stronger than it would be in a country like india so what's important is to understand that we have to manage groundwater more indirectly and this is where this nexus concept comes in so can you uh, can you click the next one so so there are a lot of things in India we can do in terms of agriculture. We can realign our agriculture and our food policies in such a way that farmers right now are incentivized to grow very high water consuming crops like rice and wheat, because those are the crops that fetches a guaranteed price from the government. Can we change that? That's one way of you know incentivizing farmers. The second is uh, better groundwater laws. Uh, well, uh, that's one, but again, we have implementation issues, but we still have good laws. And then there are everything that's been done in terms of supply augmentation through managed aquifer recharge. Maybe Pahersh will talk about it. Then there are demand management through community participation. Let's do that. And the third part is around electricity. Right now we have some programs around solar irrigation farms, but a lot has been done for electricity in terms of metering of electricity, in terms of rationing of electricity, basically providing uh, lesser electricity to farmers so that pump less or charging them a metered rate so that they have some incentive for lesser pumping. I'm very conscious of time. Quickly, can we move to the next one? So, so my here I'm trying to say is that groundwater management really needs these two three approaches. We have to look at water from the groundwater perspective. Many water policies are so cesaropenic that they don't really take into account groundwater. That's important. But in India, for instance, there is a huge awareness now that the groundwater is an issue. We have to look at electricity policy. Electricity utilities are completely innocent of their role in groundwater. They, of course, groundwater is not their mandate, but they have no often no idea about how much their policies impact groundwater you know pumping on a day-to-day -day basis and third is food policies as long as we have food policies that provides wants to provide subsidized food to the farmers in the current way i think we cannot expect farmers to be paying full cost for groundwater okay i think i have just one or two more slides left so my uh, so what i would like to uh, say is that uh, for for many of us it's important to look for solutions outside the water sector and some of these solutions have been tried we have done EMI has done a lot of work on this I have worked in West Bengal we have colleagues who have worked in Gujarat so a lot of things have been tried like metering of electricity providing a separate feeder for farmers and that feeder gets then rationed electricity for only four to six hours a day and the latest is around grid connected solar pumps can we incentivize farmers can we turn the electric pumps to solar pumps and connect those solar pumps to the main grid and then give farmers incentive to sell electricity to the grid rather than um, uh, you know pumping water similarly i have talked about the food sector giving giving higher prices for lesser water intensive but more nutritious crops like coarse cereal you know sorghum millet all those are much nutritious than rice and wheat and and finally uh, can we grow more water intensive crop in the water abundant eastern india so i leave it at that i think that is uh, all that I had to say, and thank you so much. Thank you very much, Aditi. Um, I think I now pass the floor to uh, Jelsa Kemmering. Uh, she's a, a principal, well, a senior researcher at um, IIT Delft uh, in the Netherlands, but she's in, engaged in lots of um, projects across the world doing research uh, at the moment with a, a very interesting project on groundwater. And, and she will be a kind of a facilitator for the for the panelists, and then I'll I'll join you at the end. So Jelke, the the floor is yours to introduce our, our panelists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so uh, welcome, uh, also from my side, to this very interesting uh, 
uh, session and thanks Aditi for uh, your very interesting presentation. I already see many questions in the Q&A, so I hope we can come back to that uh, towards the end of this session to make sure that some of these questions get answered. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, to announce the next speaker, Dr. Mark Gideon. Uh, he's a PD, uh, PhD graduate from Yavala uh, University in India. So can you please switch on your microphone and um, present us your research? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you for that. Good morning and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, the title of my presentation is Com uh, Communities as Trustees of Groundwater Resources a case for decentralized response uh, towards climate change. And, uh, can I, uh, and the, the, the argument really in this, in this presentation is to put communities as central towards managing groundwater. And this really comes in the backdrop of a, of a, of a failure by the central government of India to really regulate uh, the resources. Now, what, what has also happened is that uh, the challenge of, uh, as we saw yesterday, that a local and a regional response would be much better in tackling climate change. And what I'm trying to argue here is that if you break it down further to a much more a local, at a colony level, at a locality level, at a ward level, as we have in series, then communities are, are really adept in, in addressing groundwater management. And that fundamental shift really happens when we start seeing communities as not just as uh, consumers, but also as trustees. And this is what I want to get into, into the next slide. Can I have the next slide, please? Yes. So the concept of public trust doctrine, or PTD, really came after a landmark Supreme Court judgment in, in 1997. And it basically said that the government is, uh, is a trustee of natural resources. And, and in this case, it was surface water resources, such as ponds, lakes, and rivers. And it basically said that commercial interests or, uh, or even state policies and, and, and state designs cannot infringe upon natural resources. Unfortunately, uh, the judgment fell short on groundwater. Uh, groundwater continues to be tied exclusively to land, uh, land ownership rights. And you know, this is, uh, this is something I think which we were talking about yesterday, groundwater being invisible. I think this is one of those laws in India, I think, which contributed towards that. Uh, groundwater continues to be tied to exclusive uh, land ownership rights. It is considered as an easement under the Indian Easements Act of 1882, which, ex which essentially gives landowners and businesses which own land uh, uninhibited right to, to groundwater. What has also happened in rural India, and as we, and as we heard from Aditi's uh, uh, presentation earlier, is that uh, su subsidized electric electricity given almost free as a populist measure to farmers for irrigation has further driven up the demand and, and collectively these two factors have uh, led India to become the largest user of groundwater than any other country in the world. Can I have the next slide, please? So I just want to give a background of the study. The study uh, really stems from my own PhD doctoral thesis. I looked at two cities, uh, Delhi and Hyderabad. And uh, Hyderabad is in, in South India. I looked at 200 households in Delhi across 40 wards uh, across the city. And uh, it was observed that even though over the years, piped water coverage did increase and, and we have the census of India report also in 2011, which, is, uh, which said that nearly 81.3% of the households in urban India had piped water coverage. But on closer inspection, it was found that, uh, it was found by the National Sample Survey Organization, which put piped water access at only 40%, which means that most of the households were accessing water through uh, uh, were accessing um, water through groundwater or through private tanker water access or or even bottled water consumption, and uh, what what further adds to the crisis in urban India is the fact that this massive amount of uh, non-revenue water, which by any official standards is hovering at about forty to forty-five percent, uh, it basically includes. Systemic, loss, systemic losses, transmission losses, either through thefts or leakages, through contamination, uh, through, through a number of reasons which this water just lost in the system, 40 to 45%. And these two factors together have basically uh, led to an exponential increase in private demand of water. And uh, there's an increase of private tanker usage in, in colonies, across colonies, even in slum colonies where the government usually gives free tankers there's been a, there's a, there's a significant increase of private tankers. And uh, what has also 
uh, added to the private expenditure is bottled water supply, which is also uh, has groundwater as its source. So uh, most groundwater treat, uh, plants, uh, these private pl treatment plants, which uh, supply water are using groundwater to provide uh, this bottled water. And in, in my survey, it was found that when you, this, the, the amount spent by these households were as much as 8% of their monthly income. And monthly income was estimated to be about $115 by the Ministry of Statistics and Program Implementation. 8% of that was being spent on private water expenditure, which goes on to uh, affirm a long longstanding argument that poorer households spend more on, on water access for the water than median income households or even richer households. Can I have the next slide, please? So it was found in a number of colonies and a number of, uh, a number of households that, uh, that the bore wells were running dry and uh, water was scarce and which, which, which meant that households needed to drill deeper to access water. And this was significantly found among uh, urban villages. Urban villages is a categorization in, in, in Delhi of, of households which are previously rural, but were beginning to be uh, integrated with urban services. And what, what that meant was that, that these colonies would, would eventually get, uh, uh, get integrated with the urban. And if you can see the picture on the right, this is a picture of uh, Sangam Vihar, which is in South Delhi. You can see that that is densely crowded. It is haphazard, it's non-zoned. What happened in colonies such as Sangam Vihar, in Sangam Vihar is that the government through the local water utility had asked local communities to invest in subsidized bore wells. And this would be an interim measure. This is really the important point in this slide that this was to be an interim measure till pipe water access would be extended to these areas. Now, not a lot of uh, colonies in, uh, in urban villages did go through with this arrangement, but there were a, a group of households, about 20 households, which did follow this track, did follow, uh, uh, did follow up with this. They invested in, a, in, in this bore well. And what really happened uh, is that water would be pumped for an hour and then would be supplied to individual smaller overhead tanks. This is in stark comparison with uh, individual bore wells, which independent houses have. What they do is that they over extract water, they store water in large sums, and then from these sums, uh, water is then supplied to the households. This is, uh, and, and what, when, when a number of houses do that in the same colony, if, 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 if a number of them are extracting over extracting water, what happens over a period of time is that the water table goes low and that there's a net disadvantage. In my previous, uh, in the last time I conducted the survey over here in 2018, it was found that the, they had a fair access. Yes, they did not have as much as water as they would have liked, but uh, they came to understand that uh, the surrounding challenges which other colonies were facing and, and, and uh, were fairly happy with their access. Can I have the next slide, please? So the challenge really is to shift the concept of trusteeship from government to community. We get to see such a, we get to see such a transition because uh, public trust doctrine is now in a sense without the public. There is no communities involved. So the challenge really is to make communities as central towards, towards managing its groundwater uh, resources. And in a weak regulatory framework, uh, communities have an important role to play. They can play it. We can see, we, we saw from the example of Sangam Vihar. And uh, what has happened in recent literature is that there have been a number of legislations which came out in support of this. There was a national uh, water framework bill. Uh, there was a national water framework law in 2011 and 2013. More recently, 2016, you had a model conservation bill of, uh, of uh, protecting and managing groundwater, which gave a greater emphasis to the community. Uh, but the challenge remains of, of, uh, of uh, making, uh, of uh, bringing this in, in, in force. This remains largely directive because water as a, is, is, is a state subject. Individual states get to decide on their water policies, but uh, this is something which is a positive indication of, of a growing role of uh, communities. And uh, the, the last point which I want to come to is the limitations of the study. Uh, this is still a very small sample. Not a lot of communities, not a lot of uh, household con colonies have such an arrangement. And it is still, uh, it, it still uh, 
it still remains to be seen how this can be expanded in that sense, how this can be implemented, let's, let's say in, in slum colonies, how, how let's say non property households such as tenants can, can implement such a scheme towards, towards managing groundwater. Now, the challenges are significant and, uh, and uh, we, there is still a lot of work to be done, but should we address these challenges and should we understand how this can be implemented? I think it provides a useful course towards addressing the problems of managing groundwater in the coming century. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mark, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Again, I see quite some questions in the Q&A, so I also encourage everybody to uh, fill in your questions. As said uh, at the beginning, we'll make sure that all questions get answered, either in, during this session at the end or in writing uh, by the authors of the presentations. Um, so I would like to move on to the next person to present. Uh, so I would like to welcome on stage Mr. Paresh Patel. He's a PhD student at Pennsylvania State. University in the United States. So welcome and uh, we are very much looking forward to hear your presentation. Uh, thank you very much for getting me here and I am really thankful for IWRF for having such an uh, interesting conversation on groundwater and climate change. Well, a uh, great job for my uh, presentation is done in putting the context by Aditi, Mark and even the person who has shared in previous presentation. But what I'm currently interested in uh, getting on board a specific case study uh, from a arid region of India that has seen a kind of climate catastrophe and a groundwater catastrophe in recent times and how this catastrophe has led to a unique solution being built up and scaled, not even propelled by the, any external forces by the community itself. So this is a specific case of arid region of Kutch where the groundwater depletion in recent years has uh, created a self-propelled movement for managed aquifer recharge. Next. Uh, can we go to next? Yeah, so this, uh, just to give you a better, uh, just a better uh, context about the region of Kutch is the westernmost part of India. Can you get, go to the next, please? Uh, this is a kind of a, an island that's covered by a sea and salt bed, uh, and it's a mostly an arid climate with uh, very less rainfall and very high volatility of rainfall. And on top of it, there is no uh, perennial source of reliable water. There is only one a good point for the region is that they have uh, they had a really good uh, sweet water deposits. So sweet water means like there has been a good less tedious water in the region available at uh, shallow ground water aquifers. To the next. So uh, here I just want to focus like it's already told that how important groundwater is for India as a whole, but specifically focusing on the Kutch region, more than 90% of the water requirements are met by the groundwater and out of that 93% goes specifically for the agriculture activities. And in recent years, if you can see from the first figure on the left top, the irrigation has expanded to almost three times between uh, a decade of 90s and early 2000. Also, this led to a massive increase in agriculture value of production that increased from uh, approximately $3 billion uh, to get back to almost uh, $20, $24 billion in recent years. And what are the key drivers over here that like uh, the cereals and oil seeds that are the major crop production that have seen a massive increase in the yield. Uh, much of the credit goes to the groundwater that available for the irrigation in recent years. And post-2001, the agriculture, mineral production, and all other service sector and many things have seen a massive boom in the region. But this uh, boom is uh, key for the pivotal development in the region, but it has some drawbacks. Can you go to the next slide? So what the price has been paid for this, like uh, the price is paid in terms of the groundwater depletion. So on uh, left top, uh, that's a uh, uh, depth of groundwater level uh, from my own village in Kutch uh, that shows that there is an average three meter uh, decline on year on year. And more or less, like although the Aditi has rightly pointed out that overall number of uh, groundwater structures have not changed, but you can see from uh, uh, 2001 to there were mostly shallow aquifer uh, ground dug wells that have shifted uh, drastically or massively in recent years to a deeper and deeper uh, bore wells. And this has led to a 10 to 15 feet uh, decline in the uh, uh, groundwater 
and like the Buj aquifer system that's uh, highlighted in dark in the uh, top right, it has seen a decline of uh, groundwater for almost 20 to 29 feet uh, meter in uh, just uh, four to five years. And on the recharge side, uh, we are currently just recharging all less than 10% of total extraction. This has pushed a massive uh, 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 deep borewells going dry and uh, most of the villages that I've surveyed back in 2018 and 19 have seen that more than 100 deep uh, borewells that of uh, average depth of uh, 100 meter have gone completely dry and they are just a sunk cost for the communities. And the other uh, borewells that are available, they are also having increased salinity in their uh, yield of groundwater. Next. So what are the major strategies applied for the groundwater revival and aquifer recharge? And uh, these are mainly three strategies, direct recharge, indirect recharge, and uh, integrated water resource development. Most of the crowd over here might be uh, understanding about all three uh, strategies. So I will just rather uh, skip over it and say like, Kutch over the years around the 90s and early 2000s has seen this indirect recharge movement where check dams, farm ponds, control ponds, or like surface storage structures were developed in order to indirectly benefit uh, groundwater but in recent years specifically after 2014 uh, drought year and the continuous drought for four years there have been a sharp rise in direct recharge to the de defunct bore wells and what are the driving factors over here the first there are plenty of defunct bore wells there are each villages that are kind of sunk cost and they are not yielding anything and secondly most of us must be knowing this, like there is a tragedy of commons, uh, which we talk about that the groundwater belongs to everyone, but never belongs to anyone. And this kind of uh, direct recharge strategy kind of altered that view by directly providing benefit to the farmer on whose field that the recharge is getting retrofitted. The fresh water injected into the ground directly helps with better yield of the uh, groundwater structures that are deep borewells or the dug wells and also reduces the groundwater salinity and this directly benefits the farmer of the region who is uh, using the functional borewell very adjacent to this kind of defunct borewells. Next please. how this system works so i just uh, have a, a quick view of how the entire system works it's like uh, there are a sunk points or kundis that are locally called that's a point from where the surplus uh, rainfall water is diverted through this kind of slitted uh, buried underground pipelines to uh, different bore wells that are currently not yielding anything you can just go to the next And once uh, there is a rainfall or surface, the rainfall is just allows uh, this uh, surface runoff into the head aquifers. Can you go to next? Next time. Yeah. So, major point of contention here is like why different borewells recharge is preferred, and that's what my entire focus was under understanding like why this strategy is more and more self-propelled and when we look at the scale like uh, there are more than 300 villages with almost 100 different borders and most of the villages are taking up the effort to invest on this kind of uh, resources built up first and foremost thing is the reduced alternative investment required so this uh, repeated decline like the system uh, needs to have a new system of uh, uh, irrigation uh, every five to seven, ten years if the de uh, decline of aquifer continues in the same way and this new system will at least cost them uh, seven thousand to ten thousand dollars whereas if they just invest a few hundred dollars less than five percent of total investment required alternatively then they can easily increase the lifespan of existing infrastructure by five to ten years secondly it directly benefits to the owner of the field and the farm Unlike the indirect recharge met uh, methods that uh, groundwater recharge provides is uh, kind of uh, direct benefit in the farms uh, or the borewells that are adjacent to this defunct borewell. So people can uh, easily realize that how important and how easily it can be more fruitful. Thirdly, uh, for the climate of the region, it's mostly uh, very arid and dry and uh, almost uh, 
350 days around the year there is a hot sunshine and here the surface storage structures are not very good in yielding good output and whereas the subsurface storage in terms of aquifer storage and already existing system to extract those uh, groundwater is like more prone to have a uh, for the groundwater resistance can you go to the next So major early findings shows from the three villages that I surveyed last year that uh, the community tree and recharge activities where entire community of a village comes together and the uh, community uh, tries to uh, plan and develop the entire infrastructure to retrofit more, more than 100 uh, different borehouses cost them around $200. Whereas if the government tries to do it, uh, it costs them more than $500 because they also need to invest on the labor and they also and have that optimum utilization of funds. Secondly, it increases the borewell yield and reduces the salinity. And also additional irrigation made possible through the summer crops that helps in development of horticulture crops that requires uh, around the year water availability rather than the seasonal crops. Uh, just the last slide next and then I will be done. So, this ongoing research uh, got a kind of setback due to the current COVID situation. I am not able to continue my field work, but these are the few questions that I am interested in further develop and answer to the study over here is that is defunct borer recharge is more economical in a long term as compared to long distance interbasin transfer of surface water? Does installation of defunct borewells as recharge structure reduces the irrigation cost for farmers and or energy subsidies for the government? And thirdly, uh, analyze the private versus social benefit in different scales, like whether a farmer does it or the dis disjoint communities does this kind of work, or the uh, entire village or entire aquifer community does it on its own, like what are the pros and cons for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Mr. Paresh. Uh, I would also like to invite the next uh, speaker to come on stage and welcome Dr. Ashwar Kala. He's a senior uh, researcher at the Center for Resilient Studies in Pune, India. So welcome uh, this morning. We are very much looking forward to you listen to your presentation as well. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Jesli, for your generous introduction. I'm glad to share our learnings and experiences on designing and application of the water stewardship approach. Uh, this approach is very relevant and innovative for building the community's resilience to deal with speedily depleting groundwater resource and align the, their behavior onto the positive actions. In next few slides, I will explain the approach, processes and outcome of water stewardship initiative, which intersect groundwater science policies and practices for making our community, communities resilient to the groundwater management. And this is important in the climate change where this whole changing monsoonic cycle and the whole rainfall regime is taking place. Uh, so this is a joint uh, work with my colleague Dr. Marcela de Silva and Heman Pinjan at Potential Organization Trust and Ariana Tozzi, uh, she is a PhD scholar at the University of Manchester. So next please, yeah, wait, yeah. Uh, so the precipitation forecast for India under the climate change scenario suggests the higher but more variable rainfall. This indicates that the intensity of the rainfall may increase but actually rainy days may decrease. At the same time, the changing pattern of rainfall and runoff are expected to significantly impact the groundwater recharge and availability. To make the rural communities resilient to these changes, water stewardship framework is immensely useful. Here, the expected outcome of this framework is to achieve the water use that is socially equitable, environmentally sustainable, and economically beneficial. To achieve this outcome, Water Stewardship Initiative is primarily based on certain assumptions. Treating water as a shared resource in the domain of public trust is the basic assumption in this approach. For achieving this, it requires collaborative solutions where resilience building to community to climate change. The key, uh, the uh, climate change and the different vulnerabilities is at the center. These values, communities 
are not passive water users, but they have the immense potential to play an important role in the good water management. To, to receive this outcome, we need to create a necessary condition and enabling environmental environment where communities feel the sense of ownership of local resources. And there are sufficient spaces for reflection, dialogue, and generation of local specific information to the process of stakeholder engagement. Inclusive governance institutions are must for this type of management with the mechanism of sanctions and conflict resolution. When it comes to the process and strategies on the ground, water stewardship approach engages multiple and diverse relevant stakeholders at different stages. At institutional level, jealous evoks and jealous evicas who are rural youth get capacitated to motivate and facilitate villagers and particularly the village water management teams. These teams are nominated by village panchayats for taking lead in the water management in villages. They prepare water stewardship plans which include demand and supply side measures and institutional norms. Stakeholder engagement process and workshop become the central space for building capacities of villagers, share scientific knowledge to them and invite and initiate the planning process accordingly. So the next please, next slide please. Yeah. So Watershed Organization Plus implemented the Water Stewardship Initiative in 106 villages spread in mainly two groundwater dependent Indian states, that is Maharashtra and Telangana. As a result, in these 106 villages, communities are governing around 40 billion liters of water annually through the processes of water budgeting and the institutional norms. During two years of 2016 and 18, communities harvested additional around 9 billion liters of water through offering voluntary labor and convergence of different groundwater uh, government schemes. Even over 2,000 farmers have adopted practices of micro-irrigation, mulching, vermicomposting, and organic measures and saved around 3.24 billion liters of water. Villagers are currently collecting daily rainfall data through the rain gauges spread into these villages, monitoring groundwater levels, and taking efforts to execute the village water stewardship plans, which are basically the water budgeting and the uh, demand and supply side plans. Uh, next, please. Yeah. So the water stewardship initiative is framed in a manner which is complementary for the implementing state government, state groundwater policies to give feedback for their improvements. In state of Maharashtra, Groundwater Development and Management Act 2009 is in the initial phase. Major provisions of this act are piloted in water stewardship initiative. Here, groundwater is seen as an important buffer to be protected for dealing with the water scarcity in years of low rainfall for the different water needs. Hence, aquifer management and preparation of prospective crop plants based on water availability are at the center of this act. In water stewardship, uh, the water stewardship initiative uh, by Watershed Manage, uh, Organization Trust, two pilots has been put at the gro uh, ground with the aquifers which are shared by surrounding villages and the sustainable management for that. For example, you can see that in Jarna district, a common aquifer shared by 14 surrounding villages is identified and village representatives from these villages have come together for managing the aquifer sustainability. Watershed Organization Trust has developed an effective tool called Community Driven Visual Integrator through which communities are getting facilitated for making 3D models of surface and subsurface characteristics, which is resulting as the immense useful to spread aquifer literacy and make villagers realize that they share the, the groundwater from the common aquifer. And hence, therefore, they need to come together for the sustainable use of the aquifers. Uh, next, please. Bringing different stakeholders together for extending the cooperation for water management is a vital and very important. Village water management 
teams present their village water stewardship plans to the block level government officials. This helped to bring government programs in their villages and building trust between villagers and government officials. The initiative also covered the registration of all wells and water harvesting structures in the village, which helped them calculating water budget and deciding the groundwater draft in the villages and act planning for the aquifer management process. Uh, next, please. Yeah, so the, for the innovation and the innovative approach and the contribution for building communities resilience to deal with disaster risk in this 106 villages, the Water Stewardship Initiative implemented by Watershed Organization Trust has been honored with a special mention by initiative on climate change policy and governance at Venice, Italy. So this was uh, the contribution. This was the, for the contribution for the, the resilience building for the disaster risks. Uh, so I stop here and I thank you all audience and participants, part participants, and a big thanks to the organize, organizing team for the very relevant conference and allowing me to be the part of this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Esra Kala. Very nice, interesting presentation. So I would like to invite the next speaker on stage, Ms. Yang 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 uh, from the General Institute of Water Resources and Hydropower Planning and Design in the, of the Ministry uh, of Water Resources in China. So we're very uh, welcoming you as well in this conference and we're looking forward to your presentation. Hello everyone. Today, I will give a presentation about groundwater pricing policies in North China Plain. Um, because of the time limit, my introduction will focus on how water, especially groundwater for agricultural use, is priced and why it is priced in this way. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, my presentation is composed of three parts. Uh, first part is background. Um, Mm. Next slide, please. Uh, North China Plain is the second largest plain of China. It is now suffering severe groundwater overexploitation problem. The main reason for groundwater overexploitation is the fact that too much water has been used for agricultural production, and meantime, in low water use efficiency. Next slide, please. Uh, let's see how water is priced before the new water pricing system put into practice. Uh, it could be easily noticed that the ground, groundwater price is lower than surface water almost in every industry. Especially for agricultural use, uh, groundwater is almost free. Um, let's then see the water fee collection system um, before the new um, water policy. Um, in cities, the water fee collection method is reliable, but at the rural place, um, because for quite a long time, the use of groundwater is almost free, the groundwater fee collection system is almost missing. Therefore, the price of groundwater becomes one of the key issues in the whole system of groundwater governance. Next slide, please. Then I will show you how the groundwater price is designed in this system. In North China Plain, two pricing schemes are introduced here. The first is the step pricing scheme. Let's have a look at the right side of the column. A uh, three level of water price is listed here. The lowest one is a base price, which is 0 0.32 yuan per cubic meter. This is priced according to, the what, according to the water supply cost. The second level um, is an extra 0 0.1 yuan per cubic meter if the water users consume more water um, than a certain amount. This amount I will introduce later. The third level of price is a second extra money of 0 0.1 yuan um, per cubic meter plus a uh, water tax. In this way, we notice that the groundwater, um, the groundwater 
um, will, exper ex will experience a two-step price rising as more water is consumed. Three prices are naturally divide, defined and divided by two kinds of consumed water amounts. The first, we call it the water right, uh, which means below water right, mm, water users will be charged only with a base price. The extra water, the extra water once saved could be could, could be traded um, on the water right market. This reflects the supply and demand of water within a certain area. The second line for water amount is the water limit, which is connected with the water tax. Once the commute com consumed water exceeds water limit, water user not only needs to pay, needs to pay an extra 0 0.1 yuan cube, um, per cubic meter, but also our water tax. This works as a punishment to the behavior of wasting water. Uh, I, I guess you must have noticed that there is one, one line called water quota between the water right and the water limit. It works in the second water price scheme. It reflects the valid irrigation demand of water. Now let's see the second scheme, the raise and the reward. Oh, I, I think the last, the last one is missing on screen. Uh, the second is the raise and the reward screen, uh, a scheme. It works in a very simple way. Um, the water price, the water price is raised first, and of course, more money is collected. The increased amount of collect money would then be used to reward the water saving behavior. Uh, next slide, please. Um, um, the water fee collection system. Oh, no, no, no. Go back. Thank you. Um, the water fee collection system and the groundwater monitoring and the mini metering system are also an integral part of the framework. Um, they guarantee the equity, efficiency, and accuracy of the implementation. Uh, next slide, please. As for the impl implementation and outcome part, uh, we, could, we could see that a large, a large irrigation area has been included as pilot area. Over 41 million yuan of water fee has been collected so as to support the water supply and project maintenance. Um, the more important is that more and more people began to evaluate the gain and the loss when they use water. Next slide, please. As the last part, I want to uh, respond to one of my reviewers about the equity and distribution issues, I think the most important. Um, from my introduction, I believe you could have known that the new water pricing system has been designed to, to discourage water to be used equally among different area and different users by the methods of differentiating water price and raising water, uh, raising water price and rewarding the water saving. Um, it, this is our system that aims not only to control groundwater over pumping, but also to be functioning in sustainable management of water resources in the long term. Thank you. So thank you very much, Jan, for your very interesting presentation. Uh, again, I see some questions already in the Q&A, so hopefully later on we have time to get uh, back to some of those questions. So thank you very much, and that leaves us uh, for the last presentation for this morning already. It's going very fast, so uh, I would like to uh, call on stage Dr. Oliver Kracht. He's a technical officer at the International An Atomic Energy Agency in Austria. So welcome very much uh, this morning with us. We are very much looking forward to also listen to your presentation. Good morning, everybody. Morning from Vajene. Um, I'd like to present uh, on um, the IA Water Availability Enhancement Approach, which we call iWave which is a kind of a, um, improved way for us to plan technical cooperation projects. Uh, next slide, please. So welcome from the IEA headquarters uh, in Vienna. Uh, next slide, please. Um, 
why do we need an iWave approach? So um, I must explain maybe that uh, IEA is uh, supporting uh, uh, quite a high number of technical cooperation projects every year, every cycle um, in using nuclear techniques for, for peaceful approaches. And one of these peaceful uses of uh, um, nuclear techniques is isotope hydrology, which can provide critical insights into the water cycle permitting the assessment of changes over time, impacting water availability, and providing foreknowledge and enabling solutions for addressing groundwater issues under climate change. Um, now, the IWF approach I want to present now helps scientists and policymakers to identify those knowledge gaps in their hydrological assessment and understanding um, that can be solved or better addressed by nuclear techniques, by isotope techniques. Um, and then in a later stage in our project, in our supporting technical cooperation project to strengthen the capacity uh, to do this. Next slide, please. Um, the approach of iWave stems from different operations that we have in the past. So IEA is doing these technical cooperation projects now since many decades, 40, 50, 60 years. Um, and we observed that many technical cooperation projects Force, uh, focused on applying isotope to local or site-specific problems, but need, did not really move forward over the decades um, to, uh, to cover the, the uh, fundamental hydrological questions in the countries. Sometimes uh, the isotope hydrology in technical cooperation projects detached totally from conventional hydrology, which is not a good idea, not, uh, not an efficient way. Uh, and that way, little beneficial information is sometimes gained. Next slide, please. Um, so the IWF approach, which is kind of an um, um, inclusive planning process for future projects, uh, has several key steps. First, we want to identify knowledge gaps in national hydrological data and information. Then to distinguish the expertise, technology, and infrastructure support that is required to address these issues. And then to propose appropriate isotope and nuclear techniques to address the identified knowledge gaps, um, but also to promote collaboration with other national or international organizations to address the identified gaps and to assist water agencies in obtaining scientific support and technically isotope service from the IEA. So um, um, we have to explain also that one, for example, limitations we over, often have in the past is that um, being the International Atomic Energy Agency, our entrance point to the technical cooperation partners is often through the nuclear agencies of a country, uh, uh, which are not necessarily uh, um, uh, um, the central stakeholder organizations in, in, uh, in the water sector. So uh, with this IWF approach, we also try to include more uh, the complete and uh, relevant water sector uh, community uh, to then benefit from the isotope techniques and the isotope knowledge that we can uh, provide. Um, next slide, please. Um, the IWF methodology has been developed uh, with three uh, pilot studies in Costa Rica, Oman, Philippines, almost like 10 years ago. And now since approximately three years, we are uh, uh, more enhanced using the IWF approach, both in national projects and international or regional, what we call regional projects. So um, we have uh, regional projects in uh, Latin America, where we have applied IWF in Argentina, Brazil, Ecuador, and Nicaragua. Um, we are currently implementing uh, IWAVE as a methodology in uh, the regional Africa project for a better understanding and management of shared water resources in the Sahel region. So where we have now concluded IWAVE for five countries, Benin, Cameroon, Ghana, Niger, and Nigeria. And we are going ahead with several other countries now. And we also try uh, to use IWAVE in technical national cooperation projects, for example, with, with, with Kenya. Um, so far, we have uh, conducted an IWAVE pre evaluation with 38 institutions from 27 countries, which is quite a high number, but that is because we are now in, in, in a running process. So um, uh, uh, the IWAVE, uh, let's say, evaluation is in different stages in, in different countries. Next slide, please. Um, the core of the IWAVE methodology comprises four stages. And ideally, these stages are the preparatory study, which identifies national level of gaps in hydrological understanding and is presented and discussed at the National IWAVE workshop. So 
what we do here is that basically uh, when we go to the countries to um, do the iWave workshops where we invite all the water stakeholders in, in, in the country to participate, we found we need to provide some material before. So we usually hire an international expert to prepare uh, um, uh, an assessment study. Um, uh, uh, before these workshops. And this, uh, this study, which is typically like a 50 pages report, is then disseminated to the stakeholders before we do the workshop, actually. So they, they can be prepared and they can be informed what happens on the workshop so that they can come to the workshop in an informed manner. Then uh, uh, at the workshops, we start a hydrological gap analysis. We try to have present all the different stakeholder uh, representatives from metrology, from hydrology, from groundwater hydrology, but also from the water users point of view, from the water users uh, uh, associations always. And we go step by step to the different points and uh, try to identify where is uh, where, where is knowledge uh, missing that can be maybe addressed by nuclear techniques or conventional techniques to uh, um, more support uh, um, knowledge of water resources in the country and thereby enhance the availability of water in the end. Um, then the third stage is a continuous process of consultation and consensus building. So we not only want to let's say identify the water knowledge problems from from, from the ivory tower. So what, what we found that is uh, from, from our ivory tower here in Vienna, let's say, but we found that uh, uh, for successful future projects, it's not only necessary that we identify the knowledge gaps, but we get a consensus in the countries on which are those gaps and how to address them. So that we can then very soon get into an implementation stage where everybody who is relevant in the sector participates in. Finally, uh, we sometimes, because it's a, it's a high uh, um, aim, we don't ever always do this, uh, develop a national hydrologic plan or more often an action plan for isotope hydrology that reflects a program to realize desired end states uh, that captures the roles and responsibilities of all stakeholders in uh, pursuing the national water resource goal and the implementation strategy. We found this important because technical cooperation projects in IEA context are typically extending by uh, two years for a national project and maybe four years for a regional project. The water research and water uh, management um, um, questions that we are addressing is uh, typically uh, um, worked on on much longer timescales, five years, ten years. Uh, so um, we observed in the past that these projects are actually too short to address the relevant questions. And then uh, uh, the next project goes to a next question, which is maybe disconnected from the first one. So the action plans that we can uh, realize following the IWF approach, found, having found also consensus with the local water. Uh, uh, stakeholders community then helps us to uh, use this let's say small time uh, scale project of two years to be better brick stones of the whole picture and uh, to reach uh, something more fundamental and something more uh, efficient and effective on, on, a, on a longer perspective next slide please Okay, just a short overview. What are the elements of the IWF uh, um, um, assessment? I already mentioned it. We try to look at all the different components of the uh, of the water um, uh, of the water sector: the surface water, the groundwater, the water budget, but also the engineered water systems. Uh, and you see the different questions that we try to address there and uh, get response from stakeholders in the country about these uh, questions. Next slide, please. Um, a practical example is uh, here you see overview maps of uh, where we want to extend or where I have helped us to extend uh, or get a plan how to extend global network of isotopes and precipitation. You know that is a very important uh, background data set, uh, but which is uh, um, driven by um, by, 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 uh, by stakeholders in the country. And uh, this helped us to better uh, a plan ahead with our global monitoring networks. Um, next slide, please. Um, some coverage. Each, uh, each IWF is different. Um, I'm sorry, my time is up and needs to be uh, handmade or hand built for the individual country. So we observe that, that there can be not a unique approach for every country. Uh, every, every culture is different. Every water sector and policy sector is different. So we observe that we have always to go a, a hand tailored 
approach in, in every IFF procedure. And uh, we have to keep an eye on an holistic approach. Uh, uh, on the one hand, to involve all relevant water sectors, but on the other hand, to bring it back to where can isotopes and nuclear methods help? Because we are, in a way, in the water sector, a small organization. We can only provide our isotope uh, nuclear knowledge input, and we cannot solve the full, let's say, integrated water sector uh, uh, planning uh, uh, questions. So we need to find the right scope and the right size of an IVF action and uh, define what are realistic goals uh, that can be solved in the end by our cooperation projects. So thank you for your kind attention and sorry I was too long. So thank you very much, Oliver, for your interesting presentation as well. So we have now about 10 minutes for a question and answer uh, session, which is very limited because there are very uh, several very interesting uh, questions posed to different presenters, um, but I try to at least select uh, a few um, um, that are very interesting, perhaps to also steer our thinking about groundwater and, uh, and some of the presentations that were um, presented this morning. So one of the first questions I would like to uh, pose to uh, Aditi is uh, posed by uh, Rusha Desmok. Um, she's saying that food uh, is linked to consumption patterns and markets. So how could we, who, how could this be addressed in the quest of finding solutions outside the well, water sector? And personally, I would also like to add uh, to that question, how can we avoid that uh, the poorest farmers like smallholder farmers are most affected by these incentives and these measures? Aditi, uh, can you please try to answer these questions? Yes, very briefly, Rucha, thank you for your question. I was thinking more in terms of having proper minimum support price for crops such as, you know, less water consuming crops like rose core cereals, uh, millets and, and, and sorghum, etc. Because right now the farmers get guaranteed price only for rice and wheat. Uh, and uh, yeah, so uh, uh, and how not to affect small farmers, I think uh, there is a need to continue some of the social protection networks for small farmers. Right now, all the subsidies are without whether you are a large farmer or a small farmer. Everybody gets. So the kind of things that Ian presented from China makes a lot of sense. Like you kind of, you know, have different steps for different uh, consumer group. I, I really enjoyed that. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much uh, for this concise answer. Then there is a question for Paras Patel by Anka Steino. Um, she's saying, how do you ensure that groundwater quality is not decreasing when recharging the collected rainwater to the aquifer? Uh, do you, are you monitoring the water quality? Uh, the uh, this uh, work is mainly done by the farmers themselves. So firstly for the to avoid any major contamination, uh, they use the basic filtration using sand and gravel. Uh, secondly, uh, the water goes back to the aquifers, but uh, this mainly being a rainwater, there is very less chance of having a high chemical contamination or even a, a few chemical contamination. But yeah, so currently uh, myself or we are not monitoring the water quality because this entire work is mainly uh, in a, a kind of a, a movement uh, propelled by the farmers themselves and it's not uh, much from any organization. Okay, thank you very much. And then there are a few questions for Jan. Uh, the first one by Aditi. Does every country get to set its own water prices? And a second question uh, is for you is how can we efficiently manage non-revenue water? Could you try to answer those questions? Yes, I, uh, yes, um, I noticed this two, this two questions on screen. And the first one is, uh, I've mentioned in my presentation that, um, yes, uh, about the, um, for the base price we have for our, we have our, uh, we have our um, consideration about um, this price must, uh, must cover the cost of uh, the water transmission and uh, the project maintenance. And, uh, but for the extra two um, level um, price right, uh, right raising, I think um, on this testing stage, um, and uh, it, more, it works more like a uh, drive or a push to let people save water. And um, a, a, if we do want to let the price strictly reflect the value of of water resources, 
we think we must take um, take the um, the, um, the amount of water resources and accessibility accessibility of water resources and uh, um, how people use those water resources into account. Um, a second question is how um, can we um, efficiently use the uh, non-revenue water? Um, um, to this question, I, I think um, non-revenue water is, um, I think that we must let the non-revenue water less as less as possible. And that's why we um, design those system to um, include more water under the water pricing system. Um, and, and in China, yes, um, non-revenue revenue water um, has been wasted seve severely. And so um, the efficient use of those parts of water is really a challenge to every um, water managers. Also, we must let them as less as possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much for answering this question. I see another question for Patel by Elena. How did this movement that you presented start? What triggered the farmers to mobilize? Was it gradual or were there specific leaders who pulled this uh, process? I feel like it's uh, necessity is the mother of invention that we all know. Uh, 2014 to 2018, these four years had been a continuous drought years for the region. And continuously for five, six years, the region didn't experience good rainfall and uh, this entire depletion of water was evident. And to sustain the agriculture, they did not have any other source of water. And in 2019, there was a, almost double of the normal rainfall. At that point of time, the farmers themselves realized that, okay, if we had this much of water, we could have just diverted that to the aquifers to recharge them. Secondly, uh, being a coastal region, uh, most of the water, if not recharged, will directly go back to the sea and it will just be uh, uh, of no, no, no use. And uh, that's where the farmers themselves realized. There were a few pilot projects carried out by a few leaders, firstly. And so there is also a component of uh, how influential people can get the things done in a propellant manner. Uh, so initially, after the few uh, uh, successful case studies, uh, the farmers themselves started taking it up on their own. And it's mostly done in a village committee level. So like they start up with uh, creating a village level committee and plan and execute the work. Okay, thank you very much as well. There's another question for Aditi by Yetsabo Flores. How is the density of the wells over India documented? And what is the unknown or the uncertainty in this? Well, very quickly, there is the Ministry of Water Resources commissions, what they call as the minor irrigation census. Uh, so there are census officials like field enumerators who go to each and every village. They don't do the census for the cities or urban areas. It's only for village and agricultural um, wells. So uh, it's done by the state government. And by the state government's groundwater department, they hire enumerators. They have a standard questionnaire. And uh, every each and every well, in theory, is covered and asked some basic questions. Uh, there are um, some quality issues and everything. But overall, given how big the country is, uh, it, it's still a very useful uh, data point yes so the main concern is uh, the time from the time they do the survey and they do publish the data it takes almost uh, three to four years and i think that kind of time lag can be avoided through use of better you know better I, uh, itc kind of solutions so i think they should uh, they are thinking along those lines i i hope Okay, thank you very much. There are many more interesting questions. And as already mentioned, we will do our utmost best to get those, all those questions uh, answered uh, also after this session by posing the questions uh, online. But uh, we have only four more minutes remaining. So I would like to give uh, the floor back to Elena to have some closing remarks uh, and then uh, we will end this session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jesse, and thank you, of course, to all our panelists and our keynote speakers. I think we had an excellent session. I think just some some thoughts to say. Um, I think we've seen the the value of well, of course, considering that the system is changing and the climate. So therefore, 
groundwater is going to be a critical resource and how we have to look at so many kind of tools you know like we have to think about people and of course the most vulnerable but we also have to look at the clever example sent from china on how we can use incentives um i think for me from gideon you know the concept of trust and and, and community the same as as from um, um dr patel and of course uh, this super interesting movements that kind of spontaneously emerge you know by communities i think is really exciting and and how can we capture that that movement uh, with the right incentives, you know, I had just uh, this concept of the sandwich approach, you know, how you bring these bottom up movements, but you, they're supported from the kind of top with the right kind of uh, policy frameworks. I think that's really important. Just to finalize to say, I remind, remember pe remind people that please uh, keep asking questions. We will get them back to you. They will be put posted into the URA website. Uh, the posters, we have some fantastic posters because we couldn't have everyone in the panel and, and, and they're, they're on the website. Please do have a look because there's some really interesting one. Um, I mean, one on spas, one on, um, uh, again, pricing, uh, really interesting ones. And also uh, to confirm to all the speakers, if you didn't have time to really look at the PowerPoints carefully, there's some really good data there and some nice graphs. They will also be available in the Euro website. Uh, just to say, if you're super interested in governance, I hope you are, then we have another session this afternoon. So please join us and, uh, and thank you to all the speakers. We really, really appreciate all your hard work and, and good luck with your projects. I think they're all incredibly uh, exciting and I think we can all learn a lot from each other. Thank you very much. See you in the next one. <laughs>